Well, I think it's good. It's uh, six oh four, so we got a lot to cover tonight. So I think we should get started. But um, just to to start off, um, I hope none of you are singing the dissertation blues yet, and that you don't have to sing it while you're going through the dissertation because it's supposed to be a a good experience. Maybe not a great experience, but certainly um, a, a good learning experience. So. Um, the first thing I want to do is talk about what um, what the outcomes are for tonight are expected to be what I hope they will be. Um, first of all, I hope you're going to be able to understand the language mechanics of what goes into different dissertation chapters. Um, I hope that you'll get an understanding for what it goes into each one of the dissertation chapters. Um, I'm hoping that you're going to understand how the dissertation proposal and the final defense will be evaluated. Um, how you're going to be able to assemble your dissertation committees if you haven't already done that. Have some understanding of the IRB procedures that are related to your dissertation um, research. Um, understand the proposal and defense procedures and how to do your proposal um, or your defense brochure. Um, we'll go quickly through the forms that need to be submitted for your dissertation. Um, I have put together a timeline for you so you understand where you have to be with regard to benchmarks so you can finish in three years. And lastly, but not leastly, understand the personal commitment it's gonna take from each of you to be able to finish your dissertation in three years. So. That's a lot of stuff to cover tonight. Um, I hope to do it. Um, and, and I hope we have some fun along the way and that we're you know very interactive. This is a very interactive session. Um, I do have some breakout rooms set up for you. I hope you've gotten all the folders with all the material in it. And um, Audrey has found, we're gonna be reviewing several dissertations that I actually chaired and that actually turned into uh, articles that were published in referee journals. So I'm gonna want you to look at, we're gonna break into breakout rooms and you're gonna look at these dissertations. I have some questions for you to discuss while you're in the breakout rooms. I'm gonna want you to look at the articles related to the dissertation so you can see how an article comes out of a dissertation. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the mechanics. Um, we'll come back to, together as a group and um, I'll, get some of some feedback from what you've discovered and looking through these dissertations. It's structured, there's a set of questions that you'll be looking at while you're going through them. Um, we're gonna do chapters one, two, and three, two first. We're gonna go to the breakout rooms, have a quick discussion on two, two come back together and talk about two. And we're gonna break out again and do one, come back and talk about one, break out for three and come back and talk about three. I think this is a good way for you to actually see a real dissertation, what it looks like, um, how it's put together, um, take some of the uh, mystery out of what goes into a dissertation. So um, basically would just like to share with you the agenda for the evening, if I can find it. Uh, that's not it. Well, I think you all have the, you have the agenda, right? Somewhere. Um, you're, if you are not able to see there, I've been posting in the chat box the link for the OneDrive folder. If you have any issues accessing, please let me know. Um, the agenda is number one in that file. Okay, let's see here. It is. Let me see that. Well. So we're gonna, the very first thing we're gonna do is review that dissertation in the breakout rooms. Um, and then we're gonna review the dissertation format. The faculty have put together a specific format for each chapter and then how you'll be evaluated. So I'm gonna give you the rubric so you can look at how um, the faculty are gonna review it and how they're gonna judge it. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about setting up your dissertation committee. I have given you a list of faculty that are available to be on dissertation committees. That's in one of the handouts. We're gonna talk a little bit about dissertation etiquette. There is some etiquette involved in the um, dissertation process. We're gonna do a real quick review of chapter two because that's the first thing you should be working on is chapter two. 
and chapters one and chapter three. I'll just tight on, uh, touch on those lightly because we're going to talk about them when you do the breakout room. Um, the IRB, I'm going to give you the link. You have to do a certificate, the city certificate, CITI. I'm going to give you the link. I'm going to show you the flow chart about how IRB process goes. Um, hopefully, I'll give you some hints to make, to make the whole process go quicker. Then we're going to talk about what you can expect of the dissertation defense. And by the way, I would suggest you attend a couple. They're usually open. And if I were you, I would attend a couple to see just how they flow. Um, we're going to, I'm going to give you a sample of a dissertation brochure. When you do your final defense, you have to put together a dissertation brochure. Um, and then um, there's a bunch of forms. You're responsible for starting forms. So we're going to talk about what forms have to be completed. And the dissertation timeline, next steps, and then we'll give some time for questions. But feel free to ask questions as we go along. So I'm going to take a break there and see if there's any questions so far. Everybody here? Everybody's pretty quiet. Smile. Let me know you're here. OK. All right. So we're going to break into uh, breakout rooms. So I'm going to tell you what dissertations each breakout room is going to look at a dis different dissertation, OK? So breakout room one, if you go to breakout room one, you're going to look at the dissertation entitled An Analysis of an After School Service Learning Program for Elementary School ch Children. So that's dissertation one, and it's a journal of experiential education. Group two is going to look at dissertation called a comparison of web-based and paper-based survey methods. That's in two. In breakout room three, you're going to be looking at a dissertation entitled, The, the Effects of Self-Efficacy on First-Generation College Sophomore Students. And the uh, article is, called, is in the Journal of College Student Development. And the fourth breakout room is going to take a look at the dissertation entitled, uh-oh, some copy on it. A comparison of ethics education in the curriculum of therapeutic recreation, physical therapy, and occupational therapy training programs in the state of California. And you will be looking at an article that was written out of this dissertation, a study of ethics education. Okay, you got that? So. Uh, <laughs> one, one second, one second. Um, what I'm doing is renumbering because I know you had your, your breakout rooms already listed. Um, okay. If you could please, we because um, they're numbered on your seminar sheet as one, two, three, four. So I'm adding the breakout room number to those. Okay, could you that's fine. Whatever, it, it doesn't matter. Just put them in whatever. So they okay. know, but I want them all looking at different dissertations. Yes. Okay. So let's do this then. Um, in item number two in the agenda folder or in the in the session folder, you'll see um, some of you are looking in the folder itself where it says dissertations. If you notice at the top of um, Dr. Brown Welty's screen, you'll find the dis full dissertations in that folder, but you'll also be referencing during our um, our breakout room sessions the uh, Word document that's listed number two. So it's item one, two, three, four, five, six down on the list, number two, dissertations and articles. So you'll see a number one next to the title of that article. So number one, you'll go to breakout room one, or you'll be in breakout room one. So if you if you go to breakout room one, you'll have that first dissertation. And then down the list, two, three, four. Does everyone able to find that? And then the questions that you're to discuss on chapter two are when you're looking at the chapter two, what are the, some of the characteristics of the writing? What are some of the characteristics? And, and you have this discussion sheet. So you'll, somebody will need to take the lead in your breakout room. What is the content in chapter two? What is the purpose of chapter two? In what tense is chapter two written? And is there anything else about the, is there anything about the author 
in chapter two. So is there anything about the person who's doing this dissertation? Is there anything about their research in chapter two? Okay, is that, that clear? Is mud? <laughs> <laughs> How long did we want them in the rooms for? Um, let's let them in there for 10 minutes. Okay, we'll start that off. You're gonna be automatically assigned, so you should see um, that pop open right now. And so again, if um, we are using all of the resources in the OneDrive folder, so please be sure to reference the resources from that folder, including those documents we just talked about. You're going to go straight to number two for to find out what room and dissertation you're working on and the questions. Good. Yeah, I went into room two. Is there any way for me to bop in and out of the other rooms? Yes, as a co-host, you can. You can just kind of bop in and out. <laughs> so okay. you should be able to go breakout room. If you click on the bottom, you can okay. join the different rooms, and okay. then you would leave room and then go back to the main session, and then okay, you can go to a different room. Thank you for setting this up. You are very welcome. So I'll I'll go ahead and end it at um at six twenty five. Okay. Good. And I'll just do a little broadcast. Chapter two. So in chapter two, what are some of the things that you noticed? What are some of the characteristics about chapter two? Anybody? I'll start. It starts off. It feels like it's a historical perspective. Where did you start all the way up to where are you right now? With related whatever your topic might be. Related to the research, correct? Right. Okay. Well, it's okay. driven by the research. You're not writing it in I, you're writing, you know, it depends on what the topic is, but you know, it's, you're, you're saying this is where we are, or this is where it started. These are the old these are the studies before it. This is what led me to this. And this is where I want to add in the, to the body of knowledge. It's kind of what it felt like. Okay. Anybody else? Any other characteristics you noticed in the? It was thematic. Two? So yes. it was really centered around themes. And then you use multiple sources to support that theme, as opposed to an annotated bibliography. Is that what that is? Where they have this section? Yeah. yeah. So be, it, yeah. And interestingly enough, for the most part, they didn't just come up with those themes. Those themes emerged as they were reading the, st the studies, right? So they didn't just come up with, you know, this is going to be the title, this is going to be the title. They reviewed research articles, and then after they reviewed so many, these kind of subtopics emerged, okay? All right, anything else? So what specifically is the content in Chapter 2? Background, prior research about the topic. Prior research about the topic. Now, in some of the studies that you looked at, these were done a number of years ago. So, and every university has a different format for their chapters. So in the format for those chapters, they did want some background, some theoretical um, frameworks and some things like that. When we go over the chapter two format, you're gonna see a specific outline, a specific format for what CSUSB requires in chapter two. But it's basically the same content. It's looking at research articles, analyzing the research, and then, then putting them together in thematic blocks and comparing and contrasting what the different researchers found in the studies, okay? What tense was chapter two written in? Third person, past person. Past tense, yes. And that's because the research was already done and you're reporting on what was already done, right? So it's in past tense. Um, did 
Did you see anything in there about the author? I do this, or I wrote this, or I studied this, or, or no. my study is going to be about this, or my study is going to be about that. No. Did you see any pronouns in there for the most part? No. 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 So this, this is really a summary of what has been done in the research already. And th this is going to help you figure out what you're going to do if you don't already know. Any other comments about chapter two? Anything else you noticed? What about primary and secondary sources? You shouldn't have seen any secondary sources. They're all primary. They're all primary. That means you don't, you don't use another lit review as go, what goes in your chapter two. And a lot of people get their literature reviews published you know, so because they've been able to look at with the studies and then they've come up with some theories based on what's been done in the research, but that becomes secondary sources. So you do not, what you can do though, if, you, if you're looking at a literature review, you can look at their bibliography and go get that, or that source as one of your sources, but you cannot cite that particular literature review because then it becomes a secondary source. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. All right, I'm gonna put you back in your breakout rooms and I want you to look through chapter one. Now chapter one, well, first of all, what, is, what about the length of chapter two? About how many pages was it? Ours was 31 pages. 31. They're about 20 to 30 pages long. They're probably one of the longest chapters in your um, dissertation. You know, you're going to look at chapter one and then we're going to look at chapter three. Chapter one is not, um, it's, it's not as long as chapter two and it has a whole different purpose. So um, we're going to send you back to your breakout rooms. We're going to take about seven minutes for you to just look through it. The questions are, what is the purpose of chapter one and what tense is chapter one written in and what other comments do you have about chapter one? Okay, so this will be briefer, about seven minutes. Thank you. And Megan, yeah, I'm going Megan. to assign you to room four. Megan, let me know if you're not able to get in there, okay? Okay. She's gone. Okay. All right. I'm on All right. Isn't this fun? I kept them in the same room so that we don't have to okay, learn a new, a new dissertation. That's fine. that's fine. Enrique, how was it going when you were in uh, room four? They spent the first like five minutes trying to access. They couldn't access the, the file. Okay. And then they somebody re-logged in. Anyways, they were able to access. But once they were able to read it, then they, they, they got to the, the question. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, please work in your breakout rooms. Were they working okay? Yep, they're going. They, they got it. All right, so 644, about 644, and then um, that should work. Okay. So we were just talking about it for, for some of us, like actually touching the book and going through the pages is, is a lot more fun than trying to look at it 
online, but some of you are probably digital natives and you probably are just fine. But these books are so nice and they're so much fun to go through. So anytime you want to see any of them, you can go up to the doctor program office because they got these books up there that you could actually spend time looking at. So um, what did you notice about chapter one? It seemed kind of like an outline of the whole dissertation. Yep. So there's it's sort of an overview of what's to come. Mm -hmm. Anything else? What about the tense? Is it written in what tense is it written? Present. So here's the interesting thing about chapters one, two, and three. Well, one and three. When you're doing before you do your proposal defense before it's approved, it's gonna be in future tense, right? I will be doing this, I will be, so it's because it's a proposal, you haven't done it yet, you're proposing you're gonna do it. After you have your successful final defense, you have to go back and change the tense in chapters one and three. And some of it will be written in past tense. So you, you probably see a mixture in there of some present tense and some past tense is what you should see in chapters one. Anything, any comments about chapter one? When you looked at chapter one, what, what sense does it give you? It sets you up so you can be successful in reading and understanding. So, yes. I mean, yeah. it just covers all the bases, you know, where you get the history, the language that's used how it's going to walk you through. So it's the most it's, thorough introduction ever. It sucks you in. That's what chapter one does. It sucks you in to what's going to happen in this dissertation. It's almost like a mystery, right? It's setting the stage for what's going to happen in the rest of the dissertation. And so it has to be, you know, it has to it'd be enticing. Um, your problem statement and your background has to be, you know, really interesting and, it, and and it's not what you think you have to be citing other people you are not the expert yet so the first three chapters are from the experts which is not you <laughs> and most of us aren't the experts even when we're done but the first three chapters are really about what other people say is important about this topic why should i study this it's because these important people said it's an important study okay so chapter one's all about getting you sucked into this important research that you're about to do okay and it's not that long chapter one's not that long and it's very prescribed you will see that we have a very prescribed format for what goes in chapter one okay so you have chapter you do chapter two first so you get an idea about what you're going to put in chapter one right so that's why you do chapter two first. So you get some sense for what it is you're gonna write about and what you're gonna research and how you're gonna do it. Okay, so well, any other comments about chapter one? We're all good? All right, let's go back and we're just we're gonna look at chapter three very quickly. We'll be back in five minutes, chapter three. Okay. Hi Stephanie, were you able? Were you in before, or just uh, did you just join us? Oh, oh there there. she's gone. Okay. Just, just a second. Everybody back. Okay, so anybody, what what's chapter three all about? Your research design. Yes. And how specific is it? Very. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them, I ha um, had my students do tables that actually take the research questions and list what measures that you're going to do for each research question. That's how specific it can be. So that in, uh, one of the things that that does is it prevents what they call post-survey regret, which means you did all this work, you gathered all this data, and then you didn't gather data to answer your research question. 
right? Which is a, it was horrible because what it means you have to go back and redesign and, you know, ask more questions so you can answer your research questions. So I would say that this is probably the most important chapter of the first three chapters, because this is the standard you're going to be held to in your defense. You're going to have to answer these research questions with the data you collected in the method which you said, and then analyze it appropriately. If you change, if you collect data that doesn't answer your research questions, you're not going to pass, right? You have to make sure that you collect the right uh, data that answers those research questions. So they have to be designed very carefully. You have to make sure that you have the right research design. Is it going to be qualitative? Is it going to be quantitative? Is it going to be mixed methods? So it's all it's all outlined in chapter three and you have to follow chapter three exactly to, to complete your dissertation. Does that all make sense? And some of you noticed that there were some citations in chapter three, but not as many as it were in the other chapters. And that's true because you're really talking about your measures and how you're gonna collect your data and who's gonna be in your sample and um, how, what, what measures are gonna be used to actually analyze the data. So that's what's in chapter three. And it was short, wasn't it? Chapter three was probably one of the shortest chapters in there because it's really pretty, again, pretty prescribed what goes in there. Any, any questions or thoughts about chapter three? So what did you say that table was? Table research questions and then what was the third thing? I usually have my students put together a table that uh, down the, the side has the research questions. And then across the top, it has what survey questions or what interview question is going to answer that research question. So you have a one-to-one -one chart. You have a chart, you have a research question, and you might have a, a variety of different ways to answer that research question. It could be an interview question. It could be a data question. Because if you do mixed methods, you'd have both. But what you want to make sure is when you do this chart that you've got for each research question, you've got several data points in there that are going to answer that question. Or you're going to have what's called post-survey regret. You're not going to have the, the data that you need to answer your research question. And that is a big... <coughs> so you got to do that. So chapter three is really important. Now, the good news is that your dissertation chair and your committee will help you design chapter three. That's not, you know, you don't have to come up with that all by yourself. You sit with your chair and you talk about how you're gonna answer, the, how, the purpose of your uh, dissertation and what are your research questions and how are you gonna get at those answers? So that'll be a fun conversation between you and your chair. Well, what's the best way that I can get the answers to this question? Do I want to ask questions? Do I want to collect data? Do I want to use data that's already been collected and just reanalyze it in a way that answers my questions? So that's a conversation with you and your chair. And it, it's usually is a, is a pretty intense one because you have a, usually have a number of research questions. So let me just say this right off. You don't want five or six research questions. At most, you want three research questions. And I'm always happy if there's two. Because for every research question, you've got to collect the data, you got to write up the analysis, and then you got to do the findings and conclusions. So if you have five questions, you have five sections on data analysis, you have five sections on findings, and you have five sections on conclusions. You don't want to do that. You want to get at the crux of what you want to know. So whatever the purpose of your study is, you want to get the most salient two or three research questions to answer, okay? And then you figure out how you're going to get the data to answer those questions. Does that make sense? Yes. That's all going to just fall right in place. Got it? So um, we're going to leave reviewing the dissertations at this point, unless you have some questions or comments or anything that you'd like to ask about it. So what I want to talk about, remember when I was in some of your groups, I said that every university has their own formats for what dissertations look like. 
and what goes in each chapter. So I've given you a copy of what our the CSUSB dissertation chapters look like and how they're gonna be evaluated by your committee. So I'm gonna pull it up, the dissertation format. And this, um, let's see, can I share my, I can share my screen, right? Audrey? Yeah. Can I share my, you, you, I think you have to unshare. I see your screen. You can see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So you can see this. Try, try, try it one more time. Yeah, just. You can't see it? You should be able to. Okay, now I can share it. All right. Okay, go ahead. All right. I'm new. This is new technology to me. So good job. Hang in there with me. Can you all read that? The template? You could zoom in a little bit, but it's also number four. Um, let me put it in the chat again one more time, but it's also number four in your OneDrive folder. So if you want it right in front of your face. Okay, so in chapter one, you will have these individual subheadings, the problem statement, and it defines, and again, chapter one sets the stage for your study. So it's going to have a problem statement. And this is where you're going to have some citations. Okay, this is just what you think it is. It's what the experts in the field think is the problem. What's the purpose statement? And the, and the purpose statement, believe it or not, starts with the purpose of the study is to yada, 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 yada. The research questions are hypotheses. You don't always have hypotheses. In fact, generally in um, problems of practice, uh, dissertations in practice, there's not usually hypothesis. There's usually a states a problem and, and you state uh, what your research questions are. So this is the problem and what, what parts of that am I gonna research? So what are the research questions related to that problem of practice? The significance of the study. It's not what you think is significant about the study. It's what others say is significant about the study. So you go back into the literature that you've reviewed and you look at what other people said was significant and you put that in chapter, in that section and you cite it, okay? And again, you're trying to make this exciting. You want to suck people into reading this and that, that, that this is good research. Your theoretical framework, again, your theoretical framework will come from your literature review. As you read studies and you decide what you're going to do, you will see how other research have researchers have framed the study. So you will glean that from what you have read in your research studies. Assumptions, and this is mostly for qualitative research. So what are the assumptions that you're basing your study about? Um, examples of assumptions include um, um, the honesty or integrity of uh, participant responses. So you're gonna assume that everybody that responds is going to be honest and they're going to tell you the truth, but there's not going to be bias or you're not going to be coercing people to say what, uh, what they want you think what they think you want them to say. There's definitions, you know, as educators, we fling these words around and most everybody doesn't outside of education has no idea what they mean. So you put definitions in this section. Now I don't know if you noticed this, but in chapter when in this chapter. They weren't just definitions that you come up with. They are cited definitions. So you go into the research and you define things like, um, what's diversity mean? It's not what you think diversity means. You find an expert in the field and you, you put the definition for diversity in and you cite this particular individual. Delimitations, again, what restrictions did you put around your study? Did you only look at first grade and not second grade? Did you only look at public schools and not private schools? So you talk about what the limitations are that you placed on the study when you decided to do the study. And then the, kind of a summary, the summary of this chapter uh, co covered this and the next chapter is gonna cover this, your chapter two, the literature review. So you wanna make it sort of, you don't want it choppy. You want it to kind of flow between chapters. Okay, then chapter two is your literature review. And we, we're going to talk more about the literature review in depth tonight, but your subtopics will emerge as you read the different literature. 
They do, um, in, in CSUSB, they do I want you to repeat the purpose statement and the um, of your of, and the purpose of your statement and sometimes the research questions as well. Um, chapter three, you're going to start off with a discussion of the purpose of the study and your research design. The research setting, where are you doing this? Are you doing it in a public school? Are you doing a community college? Or where, where are you setting your study? Um, what's the sample? Who's going to participate in your research? How are you going to collect the data? What data are you going to collect? Are you going to do um, survey data? Are you going to do um, test scores? What, what data are you going to use? How are you going to analyze this data? Are you going to use quantitative, qualitative methods? Are you going to do chi square? I mean, you have to be specific here. You're going to do t-tests, ANOVAs. What, do you, what are you going to do use to answer these questions? Then you want to talk about the validity and reliability of your um, study and of the um, survey. If, you if you're designing your own study, you need to do a pilot study and you need to do some things with your survey to establish validity and reliability. If you use a survey that's already been used, um, you can rely on some of their, their own validity and reliability data. And actually reliability and validity is very easy um, in some cases to, to establish. You can do a pilot study for reliability, for example, um, to see if they're answering the questions that you think you're answering, the, the asking. Um, Positionality of the researcher is for qualitative studies. You don't necessarily have to do that for quantitative studies, but this is to kind of expose any bias that you might have in this particular subject. And then you kind of summarize what's been covered in chapter three, and then what's gonna happen in chapter four, coming up as chapter four. So you have this, this is what um, goes in the chapters. There's, there's some leeway, but not a lot because you'll see in the next document is the evaluation rubric that we use for the, um, I'm gonna stop this share and I'm gonna pull up the evaluation one. Um, for your proposal and for your uh, dissertation defense, your committee will do a rubric for your proposal and for your final defense. So this is the rubric, oh, I didn't share it. Oh, hold on, I'm gonna share it. So this is the rubric that they use when they're evaluating how well you did. So exceeds expectation, meets expectation, does not meet expectations. And so they, um, after you do your proposal, the committee meets and fills out this form to let you know um, if you pass. So this is the evaluation part. So you know, you know exactly what they're gonna be looking for. So when you're writing, it's a good idea to look at this so you have an idea of what they're going to be looking for when they're looking at your um, at your different chapters. Okay, any questions so far? And this it, the same thing happens with the it, chapter with the uh, chapters four and five. There's also a dissertation um, proposal uh, evaluation or dissertation final defense. Okay, are we? Is that good information? You got that? Any questions so far? We need to take a five minute break. Yeah, let's take a five minute break. So come back and what time is it? It's uh, 7.08, come back at 7.13.
when people are yawning, I think they're tired, late, they've worked all day. This is helpful though. This is helpful, Dr. Renwalti. Thank you. Yeah. I hope to be able to take some of the stress out of it. Yeah, I think it's the way like it's structured and the folder that um, Dr. Baca provided and everything. It's very, really like clearly laid out. And I, and that really helps kind of checking off the steps of it. Good, good, yeah. good. The daunting part is thinking of it, you know, too globally and not just checking off you know, chunks of it at a time, so. Lit review. I think most of you have already started your lit reviews. How many of you have not started your lit review? No, you've started yours, Chris. You've started, re re you've done a lot of the articles stuff. Anybody else? Everybody else looks like they started it. So good. So this will just be a quick review just to make sure you're on the right track. So the reason why you would do a literature review is to learn the history of the program, understand the, the literature and the studies that's already been done, um, identify ways that you're gonna study a problem. So you can look at somebody's methodology and you can borrow it. You can borrow their surveys as long as you contact them and ask them if you can borrow their survey. Um, you can borrow their interview questions. There, you, you, there are lots of things that you can learn in the lit review that you can use in your studies. Um, what, what is it that you want to include in your, uh, your lit review? You want to re re include studies and research, studies and research that are related to your problem. This is not background information. This is not context information. Chapter two is about research studies that have been done related to your topic. You might need to put a little bit of background information in there, but all that background stuff goes in chapter one. So chapter one does your context and your, your background and your purpose and your, it's, the lit review is really about research studies and looking at how the problem's already been studied. And you know um, what I what I have my students do is I have them read the articles um, and then actually write a pro the part of the research like when, where, what, how, and why. So it's about a two-page summary of each research article: what, when, where, how, and why. And what did they find out? And then you're gonna put those all together, you're gonna sort them and you're gonna make them in, uh, um, you're, you're gonna put them together so that they um, make topics. So you'll put, group similar articles, similar research together. And then you will compare and contrast what those researchers found in those studies. And that's what your lit review is. That's all your lit review is. Your lit review is looking at research, comparing and contrasting what other researchers have found related to your problem. Um, and this is just kind of like, what is the journal? I, I, I'll tell you in my study, I didn't, I cut and pasted and a couple of times when I cut and pasted, I lost what pages they were on. And then I tried to cite something and I couldn't find them. So you wanna make sure you keep things together so that you, you don't lose um, the citations and you want to be able to draw some conclusions from what those studies said. So when you're comparing and contrasting at the bottom of each section, you want to draw some conclusions about the studies that you just reviewed. So you have somewhere to go in your study. So how did they compare and contrast and what are the implications for other stuff for your study in, in studying this problem? Yeah, that's the way I kind of see it, uh, that if you immerse yourself in the literature, then you'll start to see the, the gaps. And, and then you'll see, you'll awaken to the possibility. You're like, oh yeah, 
I could I I should study this or I should do my study on that because because um, you know you, you want to find something that floats your boat you want to find a topic that's going to keep your interest that you feel you have a, enough passion to see it through and so once you immerse yourself in the topic really then it, it's just like the world opens up like oh okay i see and then um and then you'll somehow realize there is a topic out there that matches your ambition right so you might have noticed some of the language in the uh, chapter two is they do use a lot of hedging they don't say every you know there's nothing for sure in anything you know, as soon as you prove something, somebody else proves it the other way. So you want to make sure you use some hedging and um, it's safe to conclude. And one conclusion might be, uh, so you want to make sure. And I, I heard in one of the discussion groups that there was a lot of the hedging um, in, in the literature review when you were synthesizing it. Um, you need to use a formal writing style. No slang, idioms, or colloquialisms. Things, stuff, rise to the challenge, survive the test. Don't use any of that stuff. It's, it just doesn't belong in the dissertation. Don't use contractions. Do not use contractions. It's formal writing. Um, and you probably noticed that throughout. You want to strive for clarity. You don't want to use passive writing as much as possible. Um, numbers one, zero through nine are spelled out. This is all in your packet. So you can go through this and read this uh, at, at your leisure. But the last thing is avoid plagiarism. And it's, when you're doing a lit review, it's very easy to plagiarize, not meaning to. And what happens is you don't cite something, you write something and then it really belongs to somebody else. Um, and so, you know, you can have two or three citations in a paragraph or more. Your lit review should be full of citations. Nothing you write in there should be yours. It's somebody else's and you need to give them credit for it. So um, you all know what plagiarism is. And I think that for the most part, people don't intend to do it. They just forget and don't correctly cite things. So when, um, when in question, cite, 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 always cite. And there's also programs that the university uses where they run your what you've written into the program and to see if it if if that program is going to catch you know so many words match verbatim then a red flag comes up like okay you know and and you can use verbatim but you have to cite it and you have to put a page number on it right so it, it, particularly in the lit review um in other parts of your dissertation you're gonna to wanna to paraphrase more, um, but you still need to cite. So if you're using somebody else's words, you have to cite it. Or if you're paraphrasing something somebody else said, you have to cite it. Um, I, I never run into anybody who plagiarized on purpose. They just, just didn't understand the difference. So, and then of course, all this other cheating stuff is borrowing the structure of another author's sentences or phrases or borrowing all or part of another student's paper or using someone else's outline to write your paper or using a paper writing service or having a friend write the paper for you. Those are all cheating, you can't do that. Um, any questions, I'm, you have this PowerPoint, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on it. You can read through it very quickly. And do you have any questions? Any hands, I don't see any hands. Any questions? Okay, um, I wanna talk a little bit about dissertation committees and dissertation etiquette. So I know I'm pretty sure all of you have a chair by now. Or, but you may I, not have a- I don't have a chair. You don't have a chair? No. Okay, have you asked anybody to be your chair? I have, and I was told yes, but then I've changed my topic a million times, and I'm wondering if I need to change chairs. I, I haven't officially made anybody a chair, but I was talking with Dr. Luke when I thought I wanted to do HR, but that's not anywhere near what, what I'm doing now. Okay, so why don't we talk some, 
send me an email and we'll set up a time to talk and maybe I can help you find somebody that would be a good chair for you or can make a recommendation. Setting up the rest of your committee. So you do that with your chair. You don't wanna do that on your own. Believe it or not, some faculty don't get along and you don't wanna have two faculty that don't get along on your committee because that's gonna be hell for you. So the best thing to do is to work with your chair and ask your chair who they recommend to be committee members. Your second reader, the second person on your committee is one of our core faculty or our affiliated faculty. And I've given you a list in that folder. There's a list of people who can be your second readers. The third reader is somebody in the field that you know that has some expertise in the topic that you're um, writing about. So it's a community partner. If you have trouble figuring out who that might be, again, work with your chair or contact either Enrique or I, and, or, or me, I'm sorry, and we will help you find a community partner to serve on your um, committee. They must hold a doctorate. So here, a core faculty or tenure, tenure track. They've, had a, they've been approved to be an EDD faculty by the faculty, the core faculty, and they can be a dissertation chair. And they are the only people, core faculty are the only ones who can be dissertation chairs. And we have a list, she'll, she'll go down in a minute here. So here's a list of all the core faculty and affiliated faculty. So core faculty can be your chairs, affiliated or core, either one can be your second members, okay? You, know, you wanna go back up? to the top, thank you. Um, your affiliated faculty, they're either tenured or tenure track, and in some cases, they're adjuncts. They've been approved by the EDD faculty and they can serve as second readers. Um, community partners, they must hold a doctorate. Sometimes they teach in education, sometimes they teach our courses, but they don't have to. They can be somebody that you know. Could be a, a superintendent, could be a principal that has a doctorate, somebody um, that has some knowledge or expertise in the field can be your third committee member. There is no compensation. This is, um, they do this because they love you. Um, <laughs> we don't pay third readers. Um, we give them certificates and we invite them to be fellows. Um, and we really appreciate their service and you appreciate their service. Um, but these are the people who have been, who've already served as, um, fellows or third readers, um, and you're free to you call on them. Um, but again, you, you, the third reader can be somebody that you know personally um, that can be a third reader. Um, let's see, I had a committee member and the vice president for um, advancement was the third reader. So he had great experience in advancement. So he was the third reader and he held a doctorate. Any questions on your committees? No I just wanted to point out that we have a, a fellow as well, I think online, um, Mr. Thomas, Thomas, yeah, there he is, Mr. Thomas Stanek, he's also on here and he's been, he's been joining the writing sessions every night, so thank you so much, Dr. Stanek, he's Hi. available for, for advice and, and all kinds of good things, so I want to put a plug for Dr. Stanek if you want to reach out. Great, great. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about etiquette for your, your dissertation committees. Getting a chair is like proposing to somebody, right? Once you ask somebody to marry you, unless you find out that they're really not a match, you don't wanna divorce them. So you need to make sure that your chair is a good match with you because you do not wanna change chairs unless you absolutely have to. It's an insult an insult to the faculty member. They, I want to tell you, when somebody asks you to chair their committee, they are so honored and they feel so good about the fact that you asked them to chair that all of a sudden saying you don't want them to chair anymore is it's just not a good thing to do. It's the same thing with the second committee member. If you ask somebody to be on your committee, you can't, you, do, you should not, try not, unless you have a big conflict change your second committee member or your third committee. That's just the etiquette of it. And the third part of etiquette is when you publish, 
and I didn't say if you publish, I said when you publish, you are the first author on any publication that you do with your dissertation. Your chair should be your second author. Specifically, because they've spent a lot of time with you editing, organizing you, getting you through this process. So they've put a lot of work into your work too. So they should be the second author on your any research article that you, that you um, submit to a journal. They should be your second author. The third committee member may be an uh, author if they gave you um, some information or edits or read your article and did some work on your article. It's not necessary that they be a third, be the third author, but if they did any work on the article, the actual article that you submit, they should be the third author. I can tell you, I had a student who wrote, a, he was brilliant and he wrote this dissertation, but he was like all over the place and it took me forever to get him organized. And then he went and wrote a book and he never even gave me credit. I was so unhappy. <laughs> he wrote a book and he gave himself all the credit when I did a heck of a lot of work on the dissertation. So you don't wanna do that. Cause see, I still remember that. And that was about 15 years ago. <laughs> so you don't wanna do that. You, if some, it, it, people have helped you do this dissertation and, and you will get published, you wanna make sure you give them the credit that they're due. We have long memories. So that's the etiquette. Enrique, do you have any other etiquette that I don't, that I missed? Not here? I mean, I'm sure if I think about it, there's a lot of involved, but to me, I think it's, it's important to find a good match for your chair, your first reader, because you're gonna spend, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna spend some time working with the person. Um, <clears throat> and you wanna, you want someone who's just not supportive because all of us are supportive, but we're not all a good match for your topic area. So you wanna, you wanna make sure the person, um, has some interest in your area that they're, you know, because they have to put their labor into it as well. Um, and then your, your, for your third reader, it, it's, I think it's a great opportunity to bring in somebody from your workplace or your district or somebody from another university perhaps who has the a direct um, participation in in your topic? I mean, it's just I mean, it's just it's just a great thing. Ultimately, though, it's your first reader. That's the one that you're going to be that you have to really make sure you know you you have a good relationship with. And um, and if there's disagreements or whatever among your among your committee, what I found is sometimes um, the committee, we, disag we disagree. We're not disagreeable, but sometimes we have different opinions about, <laughs> but ultimately it's your chair. The first reader kind of counts more in terms of their weight. So you want to always follow the advice of the first reader, the chair. Um, and of course, you're, you're going to bring in all the edits and suggestions and ideas from the other two members. But ultimately, it's the chair who's kind of putting their reputation on it. Because the way we see it, we see you all as extensions of ourselves to a certain degree. So if our name is, is if, if we are endorsing your work that means our reputation is kind of also um there and so we want to look good we want to make sure you do a good job because it increases our influence as well so it, mostly it, it's mostly your first reader um that that you just you know just make sure it's somebody you, you get along with and 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 both sides have to be flexible but ultimately, really, um, 
we're going to help you as a program. We're going to help you uh, scaffold and give you the general guidelines, but it's your chair that's supposed to give you a more uh, up close, intimate um, advice on the the road. You know, um, it's it's like somebody, it's like somebody holding your hand at times, not all the time, and just giving you a nudge, telling you, go in this direction, go in that direction, you know? I know from um, people that I chair, um, I don't let anything go to the committee members until after I think it's in really decent shape. Um, so, so the feedback that you would get would be another pair of eyes looking at the issue from another perspective, um, hopefully by the time I, we send it out to the second and third readers, it's been edited. You, there's not many grammatical errors in it. It's in really good shape. It, was, it just means that you know, they might have another perspective to add on it. And um, so that's, that's what your chair does. Your chair really spends a lot of time making things look good and that it's right before it goes anywhere so it doesn't get rejected, right? Or it doesn't get you know, shredded. Um, and each one is different. If I can add one thing, each one is different. So, for example, I I will give more content related edits to the students I work with, but there are some chairs who really take time to like act, do actual editing. Um, you know, and it just depends on the the amount of labor that the person has committed to your academic journey but each one's different and you and and so um you may want to find out are you going to help me edit or are you just going to give me content you know um you know because not everybody automatically edits your work like like i i don't automatically edit i give more of the general stuff and my students tend to find other people to help them with the routine editing and I'm just the opposite. I do a lot of editing. So, and I do content, but I do a lot of editing. Um, I, I want, also want to say something about the chair. My, my dissertation chair, I finished my dissertation in 1992. We are still friends. We still see each other. We have presented together. We have done other papers together. So your chair, that's many years ago. I don't even want to count how many, but you know, you're, you can have a relationship with, yeah, 92. Are you counting, Elizabeth, how many years that is? <laughs> Long time ago, and we're still very close. So you can have a relation. This can be a great relationship um, that, and, and they can help you move ahead in your career, give you advice on academic issues. It's just, um, it can be a very, very fun, good relationship. Um, I wanna talk about the IRB process a little bit because that's probably, it could be a very onerous process depending on what research you're doing. Um, if you are dealing with adults over the age of 18, for the most part, you're not gonna to have to go through an IRB process unless it's a special or protected population. So if you're dealing with people with mental challenges or some kind of other incarcerated people or, you know, people that um, that have special um, protections, you're going to have to go through IRB and you need to allow a couple of months for that. I'll be honest, it takes a few months to get through IRB if they if you have to go through the full IRB process. If you are doing something that is with adults and it, they are not protected, you'll be, you'll be waived. You won't even have to go through IRB. You'll have, you'll have to submit a statement that, that asks for a waiver. But um, I just went through an IRB process with someone who's using it in the classroom and they're doing a pre-post and they're doing a, an experimental design. They're doing a digital storytelling project. And then they're doing a pre and post and it's taken us four months to get through IRB. So just know, because you just know if you're going to do deal with children um, and even in a classroom, the IRB is going to be a process. 
So I've given you in your packet of information a chart to determine what kind of process you need to use if you're going <coughs> to, depending on who's going to be in your um, participant sample. So th that's just something to consider when you're doing your design and when you're thinking about your time frame, because IRB is a, can be could be a glitch. You need to know that. You're also required to do a, a, a certificate. Have you guys done the CITI certificate? You've done it already? Oh, good. Your chair needs to do it too. So you need to make sure that your chair has an updated um, certificate. Your chair is the primary, uh, the principal investigator on your study. It's never the student. It's the faculty chair is the principal investigator. So when you're filling out the forms, you'll need to know that your chair is the principal investigator, okay? So you, I gave you the links for the city, but you don't have to do that, so that's good. And here's the chart to see what you have to do. You go online, I've given you the link. Whew. I've given you the link for um, going online to do the application. Like I said, depending on what your study looks like uh, is how complicated that process will be. Okay, so you've gone through IRB, you've collected your data, um, and now you're ready to write up chapters four and five. So you write up chapters four. Chapter four, you're going to really work with your dissertation chair on that because you're going to analyze your data. And they're going to show you how to write up the way the data has been analyzed. You're going to, so they'll work with you on that. And then chapter five is your discussion. So now that I did all this stuff, what does it mean? You know, what, you know, what's, what's the solution to this mystery? What did I find out? So chapter five and chapter four and five, when you're publishing an article, chapters four and five are the, the two most important parts of a, an article that's being published. They want to know what you did and what you found. So that's what goes into your articles. Um, so let's talk about the dissertation defense. Have any of you been to dissertation defenses? Have you attended any? Okay. So a dissertation defense is, um, let's talk about the proposal defense. So the proposal defense is your first three chapters. You have completed first three chapters and you meet with your committee and you do a PowerPoint presentation and you present what you propose to do. Now, hopefully there won't be any changes because your chair has worked through all that. So it's usually a beta complete by the time you get to the proposal defense. Um, so you'll do the proposal defense with your, your with your chairs, and they may have some changes for you. The key is not ever to be defensive. The key is they all want you to succeed, so there's no sense in being defensive about it. It's like take their advice, make the changes, and do you know what they say to do. Then you go out and collect your data. That will tell you at that time whether you passed or not, and then there's some forms to fill out. Then you collect your data. You cannot collect your data until after you do the IRB process. So you have your proposal defense, then you do your IRB. You cannot collect any data until IRB has been satisfied. You might have to start, if you collect any data before IRB is approved or waived, you'll have to start all over again. They will disallow it. You cannot collect data before it's been approved. The university can lose all its federal funding for just for an infraction like that. So, you, so that's very important. You can't do that. All right, so you collect your data and then you work with your chair and you write up four and five, and then you have your final defense. Your final defense is about chapters four and five. You kind of review a little bit about what you did in chapters one and three, but you can expect that since they approved what you said you were gonna do, but they're not going to question what you did, because as long as you followed and did what you said you were going to do, you've been approved. And all you now need to defend is what you found and that your methodology was sound, um, that you didn't manipulate the data in a way that isn't correct. So you need to make sure that your data analysis, um, you need to work with your chair and make sure your data analysis is correct. 
you will have to talk about how you did your data analysis to make sure they will want to know that you did your data analysis, you did your statistical runs, and that that you know what this data means. Um, the only person that I've ever worked with who did not pass her defense, we told her she wasn't ready to go to spend because she didn't understand the statistics at all. And she said, no, I'm defending and she defended and she failed. So you need to be sure that you know exactly what you did and that your statistics are correct or whatever methodology you use that your chair has said you're ready to go. If you go before your chair, there's no guarantee you're going to pass. You also need to put together a dissertation brochure that has to be distributed, um, I think, about a week before your dissertation defense. Let me see. I have a copy of that. Let's drop my chair. That's in your packet. I use Kevin Chastain just um, completed his dissertation and he passed. And that was his brochure, the one that's in the. Dr. Brown, you're muted. Okay, thank you. Have I been muted all night? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you didn't hear all my jokes because I was muted. That's all right. So any questions about the dissertation defense? Anything I've said so far? Any no questions? You're all good. Dr. Brown Welty, um, so a lot of the dissertation defenses are during the workday. Is there any, is there a library of it? Because some of them were online, I saw, but were they, they video, were they record, were they recorded so we could see them? Um, I don't think we have a good, Enrique, have they been recorded? Do you know? We, we have, early on, we had some recorded, but that was before, COVID, where we asked permission, we have to, we'd have to go back and look in the files. But ever since COVID, when we switched over so that everything is virtual, we just make, we just leave it open. And it's at the discretion of the student, whether he, she, or they are, you know, want to record it. Um, and usually they don't. I think they just made, maybe they're kind of shy about it, don't want it recorded. But um, I mean, really, I don't know if we can force anybody to record their defense, but we could try to get volunteer. But we, you know, we do have some, rec okay, I just saw there. Yeah, we've had some recorded. Um, okay, very good. So then the, uh, the Dr. Baca can share the ones we do have. Okay, she'll send that out to you then, so you have that. Thank I, you. I think it's good. It's good to watch because then you don't want you don't want to be in the dark. You want to know as much of everything that you could possibly learn beforehand, and and um, you it, it, the the story that was shared earlier is a good story. You don't want to. Um, go against your committee you you basically you want your committee to say to tell you yeah you know you're ready uh and and there should be no surprises the day of your defense there should be no surprises and most of us uh put ourselves in the position of learner i've learned so much from the students i've had over the years and so if we just you know if with a little humility, we end up, you know, being the learners and you all are become the experts at what you research and, and study. Um, but you really do have to wait for your committee to kind of give the nod and say, yeah, you're, you're ready. And, and along with that, if your defense should be like an academic discussion. You present and then people that are, are our faculty aren't out to get you. 
we're out to make sure that, you know, that there may be things you didn't think about. There may be things that should be in there. You know, when you get to chapter five, I'm going to be really honest. Usually chapter five is the worst chapter because by the time you get to five, you're like, oh my God, I don't, I can't do another word. You know, so usually chapter five isn't as polished as it should be because you've just been at it and you, you know, kind of have fatigue. So you're usually at your defense, your committee will help you really polish those last two chapters. And that's how you should look at it. You shouldn't be defensive. If they shouldn't, it's not an I got you. It's uh, let's really polish this so that it, that all the work you did is really reflected in these last two chapters. So that's really what your defense is about. It's really about an academic discussion, peer review. Um, it's not supposed to be an antagonistic at all. And it, it doesn't help if you become defensive. It's really a time for you to listen and kind of take in the, the other side of what people have to say about your defense. Um, and then afterwards you go and have some champagne because y'all going to pass. Um, the last two um, handouts I wanna share with you are probably the two most important things that I'm gonna share with you from all night and the, the, the timeline so that you can graduate in three years and then one last piece. So I back map this for you. So in order for you to graduate in the spring semester of next year, you have to have your final defense on or before April 8th. In order to meet all the deadlines for the university for commencement and all that stuff, it has to be April 8th. If it's past oh, Shannon, that- Shannon, let me just jump in real quick. Um, I, I actually changed it to April 1st. Okay. All right. And so the one that's in the folder, I, I listed it as April 1st only because it cuts it very close. And that way, at least you have a spare week just in case. Okay. Did, um, did you change any of the other dates? Are they all the... Um, I think I did change just a few dates. Okay. If you want to pull it from the chat box, um, you will see the same one that, that they're probably looking at. Okay. Um, but, it, and, it, and I just bumped a few of the dates only because of my own experience and what we've been hearing about IRB, I think is the right right dates, but I think I just moved a little bit for the chapters um, four and five. Okay, all right, let me um, let me unshare and then share this one. Sorry, thank you. I just no. wanted to make sure. And I added um, also into the folder, my own timeline, but remember my timeline, when you look at mine, that it was on a quarter system. So I added in um, a third page, which is like a blank, for everyone to, if you wanted to track your own with your actual dates, that that's available for you too. Okay. Can you, and it's the same document. Yep, that's it. Okay. So by April 1st, on or before, um, so then you can back map it. So that means that all three chapters have to be completed and sent to the committee for review by March 20th. Okay, so that's, and then between April 1st and May 1st, you have your preliminary proposal defense. And then buyer before May 1st next year, you have to have your um, IRB certificate um, and have the IRB approved it. So if you follow this, you will be able to graduate on time, All right. So, and then Audrey, thankfully put this, this was her timeline. So she took that timeline and then figured out her own dates. So I would suggest you do this, look kind of a perk chart, Gantt thing. Yeah, so the page three is, is mapped to anticipated dates for next year. So you can start building it now and, and you, know, uh, you know, whatever, you know, that, that one that I have there, those are my actual dates. So I had different dates and especially around Christmas, I got caught in the Christmas crunch where IRB was no longer reviewing and I had to wait for them to come back. So it took me an extra month for IRB, just not even because of, I had one revision, revise and resubmit, and you could see the timeline there. So yeah. um, give yourself enough time with your own work schedule to set out, um, set your dates and then print it off and adjust accordingly. But it's better to front load your dates to like the closest date possible. So that way you leave yourself with a little bit of a cushion. And I, by the way, IRB does not meet in the summer. So they meet very minimally. And the response from um, Michael Gillespie was that it's the timelines are listed on the website and it's, they might discuss it, 
they don't meet for full board review and it takes like 30 some odd days like through the summer so oh, just anticipate being done before the summer um and submitting prior to the summer deadlines any questions on the timeline so we need to get chapter three i'm sorry we need to get um one two one two and three done by this march 20th correct right i have a question completed and to the committee i mean there's some wiggle there's some wiggle room so let's say you don't don't get it till the 25th that just means you have less time for the next one you know that you'll you'll crunch it you know you see what i mean if you go over that means you're going to crunch something else in here does this make sense to everybody okay so you can put together your own sort of time schedule based on this Hold on. That's okay. All right. So the last thing I want to cover. Um, Melissa has a question, Dr. Bramalty. Okay. Go ahead. I, I have a question about <clears throat> the brochure. And so is, is that example the specific format we should be following or yes. can we use any for? Okay. Thank it you. should be that format. Any other questions? I'm about to wrap. Go ahead. The brochure was to be a week in the week before the defense. Yeah, so okay. that she can get it distributed. Okay. And by the way, um, because of COVID, we were doing them online, but we probably next year, by the time you're um, ready to defend, we will be doing them um, open to the public again. Anybody can attend. Nobody can ask questions, but your committee. So you don't have to worry about somebody coming in and from outside asking questions. It's only your committees permitted to ask questions. Um, <clears throat> when the committee decides whether you passed or failed, they will ask you to leave the room and everybody will be asked to leave the room. And then they will have a discussion and grade, you know, do that evaluation form. And then you will come back in and you will be um, told whether you passed or not. And then one other little etiquette thing is you cannot use the, talk, the title doctor until the, um, it has been posted to your transcript. Um, I had a guy who didn't, never made the changes and five years later, I found he had a business card with doctor on it and he had never ever turned in his changes. Um, we asked him three times, to turn all you do is turn in his changes, right? Five years, he didn't do it. So finally, after he did it again, two years later, he still had business cards. Um, I called the superintendent because he got a raise and everything. You know, when you get your doctorate in some places you get a raise. Um, I called the superintendent and said, ask me about so-and-so. So he asked me about so-and-so and then he went to so-and-so and said, um, you either finish your dissertation this this semester that's before a certain date or i'm taking back a raise so he finished but it's it's right it's it's false it's falsification of credentials so you don't want to do that it has to be posted on your transcript before you can use the title dr welty brown or brown welty i, I can i make one statement uh-huh if, if it's positive it, it is very positive um <laughs> I didn't have anybody do this for me when I was in 13. We never saw this. I got it from you way after the fact. I didn't start in year two. I'm starting the end of year three. Literally my last class is next, next semester and I'm just starting the lit review. So they didn't do this before. So I will tell you that even if you miss a deadline and you push it back, it just means you can still finish. It just means your date's changing. Right, but you won't graduate on time in three years. Correct, so this, this but I just want people to know that if they miss something, it may cost you extra money, but it's not the end of the world. Right, right, yeah. But our goal is to get you out of here in three years. We want you to finish. So last questions, because I have one last thing to share with you. Any last questions, comments? Was this helpful? Okay. 
All right, I want to share one last thing with you. And um, if I were in person, I would have had this printed and laminated for you. Can you see this? What does this have to do with my dissertation? I want you to copy this and I want you to make several copies and I want you to post it where people can see it so they won't bother you. So that you look at it and when people ask you to do things, you can ask yourself, what does this have to do with my dissertation? And if it doesn't have anything to do with your dissertation, you say, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to work on my dissertation. And th this will help you. This will help you get yourself in a box so that you can finish. So print it and put them everywhere to remind you that you have to, you really have to focus on getting this done. Enrique and Audrey, any final closing remarks? I would love to just say, um, I, I love that comment, Olivia. Um, we can get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we have the writing, get finished writing sessions every Wednesday. We talk about this and Jessica's there every Wednesday and Jessica's my shiny star because Jessica, right? Jessica, if you wanna to speak to it, how much these have really helped you with your progression and your writing. And again, they're not required, but it comes back to you prioritizing yourself and your writing. And basically in the get finished sessions, um, Dr. Stanek's there, he answers questions. We have students that are outside of the classes. So you get a chance to meet and have these regular discussions weekly. If you wanna talk about writing, we can talk about any one of these topics. Um, so just wanted to put a plug for you. And just, if you wanna feel supported and like in a, in a group, you're welcome to join those writing sessions every single week. Great, thanks, Audrey. Yeah. Enrique, do you have any final comments or anything? Yeah. Oh, Jessica has a question. Oh, go ahead, too. Jessica. Go ahead, Jessica. No, I just wanted to, to make a comment because I'm in cohort 11. Um, so I am definitely not on a three-year graduation plan. Um, <laughs> but I will say that the, the writing sessions on Wednesday have been extremely helpful. I have made more progress on my dissertation this semester than I have since I started the program um, to the point to where my lit review is now done. My chapter one is done and I started my chapter three. So um, our cohort, we actually still take the qualifying exam based on our lit review. So I should be taking my qualifying exam either next week or the week after, um, depending on feedback from my third reader. So that's just another plug for the writing sessions because I would not have made the progress um, that I have in this past, what are we in week 15, um, that um, without you know Dr. Baca's support because I bounce ideas off of her or she just lets me write. Um, so it's been a huge help um, in being able to get done. Thank you for that. The, the um, something that most people, I guess, don't realize until after the fact is writing your dissertation in a lot of ways, it, you're exploring your identity, your positionality. Um, it, it's it's, it's um, something very intimate um, to you. Um, and so, I think it's important to find a topic that is going to, I said this before, is, that's gonna keep your interest. That's, that's something that, that, that you have some passion for. And one thing that works for some students is that I, I ask them, write your acknowledgements first. The, acknowledge, the acknowledgement section is the one where you write you thank your grandmother, you thank your grandparents, you, you do this, you do that. And um, I have a student right now who's from uh, one of the early cohorts who you know, has taken a long time to come back and finish. And um, she confessed the other day that, that yeah, that the, the only thing that kind of kept her going was she would read that acknowledgement section and she would feel like, I, I got to finish this. I got to figure, figure out a way to finish this. Um, and so 
uh, and at the same time, uh, it, it's an educational journey and it's a very personal journey. It's almost like giving childbirth. <laughs> it is. <laughs> if you, you know, uh, where, where it, be, it, it, it becomes an extension of yourself and it's so much worth it. So I just want to make sure everybody understands you got to finish. That that's it because um, I've heard some people say uh, the only good dissertation is a done dissertation, and then um, uh, Dr. Brown Welty, I hear she says um, ABD is BAD, so that's ABD an, is BAD. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. That's it for me. All right. Any last comments? I've kept you a few minutes over. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, Megan? Oh, no, you had just, okay. So um, I, one last thing about the qualifying exam. The scores are coming in. So far, everything looks good. They're supposed to be in by noon on Friday. So hopefully I'll have um, something out to you Friday afternoon. So, but this, the, things are looking good. So when you say it looks good, that means we're passing? Yeah, so far, that's your passing. So if you don't hear Friday afternoon or evening. That, that then... just means that some people didn't get their scores in on time. So I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't read anything into it. Okay, <laughs> I'm an overthinker. <laughs> uh, don't overthink it. All righty, yep. Can I speak to you at the end? Sure. Uh, sure. All right, thank you everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. Oh, have a good evening. Uh, Sharon, can you hit stop on the recording for me? I can't do that. <laughs> there should be a little button on the bottom. On the bottom? Uh, on your uh, tool, your it. Zoom yeah, toolbar. It. Did it stop? Perfect. Uh, not just yet.